have a there's a shaitan bothering you or you have a, somebody's done ayin on you or something somebody's done evil eye on you but you're not really you know and, and um, you know this is a spiritual problem and I wanted to address that a little bit you know over the last I would say few months I've dedicated myself to you know if those of you that have been following my khutbahs um, I've dedicated myself to talking about the intersection between uh, the Quran's message and its healing as particularly for emotional problems and psychological problems the way I look at it Allah created the human being with a set of needs right we have physical physiological needs food shelter etc we have um, spiritual needs and we also have emotional needs human beings are unique not only because we have spiritual needs but also because we have emotional needs and uh, by the way I'm uh, open late at night here let me, let me see the iPad because I have some questions from people on here too um, but in any case you know oftentimes people have an emotional crisis like a lot of people came to me today I can't concentrate I'm having a difficulty with um, you know anxiety some somebody came to me and said I have I, I was diagnosed with attention span disorder you know with ADD ADHD and what can I recite to help me with that problem you know, and what can I, what, what Quran can I recite? What's the Islamic solution to this problem? And I think it's important to address that when somebody has a psychological or a health condition, that you can't just say that they need a spiritual remedy. That that's an unhealthy approach to solving that problem. If somebody has a psychological, you know, concern, an emotional problem, then they need professional help that can address that problem. And they don't necessarily only need religious advice or to, you know, do some kind of dhikr and the problem will go away. Allah made us spiritual beings and the spiritual problem has a spiritual solution. An emotional problem has an emotional solution. A psychological problem has a psychological solution. We have to respect that. There are people with real psychological trauma. You can't just tell them, recite this surah and your problem will go away. No, you have to actually allow them to go in the hands of, you know, serious professionals that can address their issue and help them dig at the bottom of it. I mean, I met college students that were, today I literally, I met some college students that were contemplating suicide because their PhD paper wasn't accepted. Right? And they're going through serious depression. And that's, yes, they need psychological, they need, you know, a spiritual reminder and hope and all of those things. At the same time, it's absolutely essential that they go to a professional. It's absolutely essential that they go to a counselor or a therapist. That's not something we should be taking lightly or sweeping under the rug. So that's one thing that I thought came up over and over to, again today uh, that I think I should bring to everybody's attention. And I'm hoping, inshallah, uh, you know, one of the, I mean, my, my first seminar I put together was on, um, on the order of the Qur'an, which is a literary consideration. But I'm also, I've been told to speak louder, but I'm speaking as loud as I can. I'm sorry. I apologize. I lost my voice. I was teaching a story night. So I'll do what I can. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, on the one hand, I, I put a course together on the order of the Quran, which is a literary consideration. But I think I'm probably pretty soon I'll be putting together whatever I can of a course on the Quran uh, about the Quran and emotional well-being. How does the Quran address things like, you know, uh, anger and sadness and depression and anxiety and you know, uh, overwhelming fear and those kinds of things or lack of confidence? These are important things. These are these are important matters, and you know, we have to. We have to figure out that, or understand that the Quran doesn't just have spiritual solutions; it also has emotional, psychological solutions, and we have to seek those out. Another interesting question I was asked. Um, I was really sad to hear it was uh, about a family, um, and, and they confided in me about how the husband and the wife see Islam very differently. So they belong. You could say they belong to different schools of thought. You know, if you know my work, you know that I don't name groups or ideologies or schools of thought and things like that hmm? okay uh, I've been told again I'm, I'm under instruction if you just tuned in and your cousin forced you to watch this my name is Numan Ali Khan I like talking about the Quran and also answering people's questions and some people don't like that I do that but I like it so I'm gonna keep doing it hi uh, so uh, what I was gonna say and by the way you should like the page and you know things you do follow and stuff so that I could bother you later with other things um, so anyways, so this husband and wife, they see Islam differently, and the, 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 the wife says to the husband, if my kids take a picture, that's haram, and they're going to burn in hell, so you can't take a picture with my kids. You know? And on the other side, the husband, if he goes to pray at this masjid, if you go to this masjid, then 
that's the same as doing kufr and things. And it's become really extreme. And she follows these, you know, these people that teach her this stuff. And he follows sort of an Islam where he doesn't believe in that stuff. And there's a real conflict inside the home. And he was literally, the man was in tears. He was just in tears. And I wanted to take a step back and sort of say that, you know, everybody's entitled to their own religious beliefs. But our deen is not extreme. And our deen is not like on a, on a moment's notice ready to condemn people to hell. And nor is our, the sunnah of our beautiful Prophet Wasallam one that's constantly pushing people into this is haram and this is haram and this is haram. That, that's a very merciless way. Um, it's a very merciless way of you know, projecting the religion. Especially to children, to teach children everything they do is haram. That's a, that's a serious problem. And of course, you know, you're entitled to do your research and your study on fiqh matters, on issues that are matters of halal and haram. But I honestly believe most of the time when people are quick to point something as haram, they don't know what they're talking about. They haven't even studied the issue. They don't even know the texts that are involved, the fiqh that is involved to arrive at those conclusions. And it's a, it's a serious thing. I don't normally talk about fatawa because when I personally in my life, when there's an issue, people, people for example comment on the size, on the length of my beard or taking a picture or whatever else. These are things I discuss exhaustively with scholars that I trust. And that's for me personally to know and that's what I recommend to you. If you have a fiqh issue, go to somebody who's qualified in it and discuss it but don't make it a contention in the home. This is not how the environment in home should be. Uh, finally, uh, just a couple other questions. Um, let me see, what else did I, do I remember? Oh, a lot of people asked me to make dua for them, so I should mention that. A lot of people that, were, that are sick, that were diagnosed with something difficult, whose children are going through difficulty, whose parents are being diagnosed or heading into surgery, and I'm sure so many of you have family that are, you know, that are struggling with health and things like that. May Allah give shifa to the Muslims and to you know, take the difficulty that they're going through and make it a means of expiation and a, and a forgiveness for their sins. And may Allah help you get through this test as a means of uh, not only your forgiveness but also making you someone stronger you know like uh, uh, Allah tests people with as much as they can bear so then sometimes people are going through really hard d difficulty really difficult medical conditions and they're like why is Allah doing this to me honestly if anybody else was in your position you, they wouldn't be able to handle it you are strong enough to handle the tests that Allah has given you not that you deserve those difficulties, but that is in fact a test. Goodness is a test and difficulty is a test. So I pray that Allah helps you navigate through that test with, with uh, a great deal of ease. Inshallah ta'ala. Somebody has some Qur'an questions. I want to pull those up and share them with you guys. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, please tell us about the hijab. I live in a country where people react to me aggressively because of my hijab, what should I do? I don't know the level of aggression that people react to you with, um, but protect yourself. Really, don't don't put yourself in, in harm's way. Our deen doesn't want you to put itself, put yourself in harm's way. And at the same time, I say that if uh, hijab is a part of your identity, uh, then just people looking at you funny or criticizing you or being cynical towards you is not a reason for you to feel inferior. We have to be proud of who we are. People are proud of looking as weird as they do, and we can be proud of obeying Allah. It's, you know, we have to learn to really stand tall with our deen. And for some of you, that's a lot harder to do than others. It's easier for me to say that. But you know, for some of you, a sister that's wearing hijab and going out there and people are saying terrible things, that's not an easy thing for her to overcome, right? So inshallah, that's, that's going to be something that may Allah reward you for. Maybe you wearing the hijab is a bigger act of worship than somebody wearing it in some other part of the world where it's so much easier, inshallah. Somebody wrote, I can't wait to see you in Indonesia. That's not a question, but cool. I'm not coming to Indonesia soon, but I will. And when I do, I hope to see you, inshallah. Um, let's see. How can I be productive at day? I'm suffering from laziness. Yeah, me too. Whew. The only way to come over your laziness is to put yourself under a great deal of pressure so you perform. Oh yeah, I got to introduce myself again because some people just tuned in. You know what? It's so late. You, you tuned in now? My name is Damal Ali Khan. I love talking about the Qur'an. And right now I'm trying to answer some people's interesting questions, inshallah. Okay, so just a few more minutes. Uh, somebody asked, they sent me pictures. I don't know what to do with them. Mm. Somebody's inviting me to play Scrabble with them or Words with Friends. I'm not, no, I'm probably going to win. So don't bother. Um, uh, 
Some people say that Samiri got a skin disease because of this ayah that says la misas. It's possible. I don't know that for a fact. Um, it's not explicitly clear. Somebody asked a vocabulary question from the Quran. I guess that's cool. Um, the word dharra, some people translate it as mustard seed. Others translate it as Adam. A dharra is a speck. It can be a mustard seed. I don't think at the time the word Adam was in circulation, so I wouldn't translate it as Adam. Um, let's see... How can something feel so right end up like this? How do I get back up and strong on my deen again? I don't think that I understand the English, but I think I get the gist of the question. Sometimes you are following your deen, you're doing the best you can, and you fall. And you never expect it to fall the way that you did. And sometimes when you fall, you go down a spiral and keep on falling. And it doesn't help that there are others that are you know, pushing you down even further, disappointed in your mistake. It is at that time that you realize the only one, truly the only one that is a support to you is Allah Azza wa And you have to find Allah as a means of your only and only support. May Allah Azza wa help you reclaim your faith and really recover from that kind of trauma. I know it's difficult. It's, it's something that's not easy to overcome. Uh, take it from someone who's experienced it in the past. Um, let's see. May Allah bless you. May Allah bless you too. Is it permissible to pray Isha after the Islamic midnight? I don't know what the Islamic midnight is. I only know of one midnight. And if you haven't prayed, just pray, dude. Hmm. How do I go about convincing my family that I'm ready for marriage? I'm in the first year of college and I have a stable job. I'm the youngest and would be the first to get married in my immediate family. So they aren't taking this very seriously. I don't know. That's a hard one. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that in detail sometime, inshallah. This is moving too fast. I can't even read it. Uh, oh yeah, when I give a khutbah, can I ask my followers to listen to it and not comment? No, dude, because when I'm giving khutbah, I'm talking to my audience in the masjid. Not, to, I mean, it happens to be on Facebook, but I ain't talking to you guys on Facebook while I'm giving a khutbah. That's not going to happen, okay? Um, that's in Spanish. No, that's French. Then you said legend. Need my contact details so you can talk to me. Uh, you're contacting me right now through Facebook, dude. So that's good. Give me some like a question. Question. The topic of single mothers is not dis discussed frequently. Let me open that up. Hold on. That was important. Scholars issue. Scholars should emphasize and talk about issues single mothers go through. Sure. Um, single parents are a challenge. It's difficult. It's difficult to go, you know, and, and whether you're a single mother or father, and I can understand that single mother struggles are much more difficult than, than single fathers. It is a component of our society that should be supported, who should be awarded every ease. Um, I personally do believe that there are segments of our society that are overlooked and I'm hoping over the course of the next series of khutbahs that I address every one of these because in our society, for example, women that get divorced are often labeled uh, and they're often looked down upon as something was wrong with them, right? That their marriage has failed or that they're now raising the children and they deprive their husbands of their father and et cetera, et cetera, and, and vice versa too. These kinds of indignations and alienation of uh, you know members of our society just because they've had these experiences in family they're unfair and they're uncharacteristic of Islam. So I'm hoping that inshallah over the next few weeks, particularly I'm doing a khutbah series right now on dignity, and I want to highlight these particular uh, you know uh, segments of our society of Muslim society because they're not awarded the dignity that they should be. So inshallah I hope to cover some of that. I love you back, bro. That's what you wrote. I love you, bro. It's cool, I, lo I love you back, bro. I like, like one more. Let's see. I read people stop writing. Let's see. Someone asked, What is pride? Can you elaborate on pride? Oof, pride. Uh, okay, yeah, sure. Um, and I'll take this one as my last one pride, and then this last one, okay? Um, so what is pride? Pride is not that you're confident. Let's talk about what it's not. 
pride is not that you're proud of something you accomplished. If you graduated from school, you finished your PhD, you got a high score, you won the game, and you gave somebody a high five, and then they say, Astaghfirullah, kibr, you just won the game, and you're proud that you... No, hold on. It's okay. You can feel proud of your accomplishments. That is not kibr. Pride, in the, in the sense the pride that should be condemned, is when you think of yourself as more important, more worthy, more deserving, superior in some way to somebody else. That's essentially pride. When, when somebody else is, and even if you don't feel superior, you think someone else is inferior. So even if you don't, you know, ele elevate yourself, the fact that you're putting someone else down, that's pride. Kibbut is actually when you put somebody else down or you think of someone else as inferior. And that's a disease. That disease can be in the heart of someone who literally has no money, no status, no power, and yet they have pride. They have nothing to be to feel like superior to somebody else, but they can put someone else down, which is why kibbutz and pride can be a problem inside of a family. It can be a problem, in, in, you know, at the highest level, and it can be a problem at the, at the lowest levels. Even among friends, there can be pride when someone's condescending towards someone else. Allah says, "Watilka darul akhirah najaluha lilladina la yuriduna uluwan fil ardi wala fasadan wal aqibatul muttaqin." The final home is for those who don't want elevation in the in, in the land. You know what that means? To feel superior to somebody else in the land. So being confident, being being sure of yourself, you know, being acknowledging that the skills or the talent, the, the intelligence that Allah has given you, none of that is pride. Pride is when it is in comparison to someone else, and you feel that you you, or you feel in you or you express in yourself, you know, a sense of superiority over anybody else. May Allah protect us from it. And the final question that I would like to share with you: What should we do in case we find our very close family sibling in something haram? When I am the only one in the family who knows about this, and I know that if anybody else finds out what haram that other person is doing, you can be in pretty bad situation. Uh, you need to confront them about it. You need to talk to them about it. And if they're a grown adult, they have to make their own decision. But you know, at the end of the day, you have to also ask if if telling on them is going to fix the situation or make it worse. Are you going to push this person away from the family? Are you going to you know because they're doing something wrong? But behind everybody's action, there's a there's a set of reasons. What are they going through that led to that? What emotional state were they going through? What, what, what happened in their life that maybe you're not aware of that led your sibling or family member to go down this, this evil path? And maybe you need to focus on helping them instead of calling them out uh, and really offering your help. And that's, at the end of the day, we can't change people, not even our loved ones. You can't guide who you love, but you do your best to, to, to at least be a source of support for them, inshallah. So that's it. These are just a few questions that I had today. I'm really, really excited that the program, and I'm very grateful that the program went beautifully today. Met some wonderful, wonderful people. And I'm hoping to meet more of you tomorrow in Birmingham and over the course of the weekend in Manchester, inshallah. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.